to kind of bring the meeting to order and thank you for your attendance. Uh, welcome to the meeting of the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. I'd like to inform everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live in the Combined Authority, to the Combined Authority website and available for subsequent viewing. And so by entering this room, you're consented to being filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for future purposes. Um, can members and officers please ensure that you press the microphone before speaking and turn it off afterwards? And finally, can everyone ensure that their phone is switched to silent, please? Before I open the, the meeting, um, we understand that Bob Pratty is the Chief Executive of the ACC Liverpool, Long Bill Addy, um, who is a priest at Our Lady at St Nicholas Church in Liverpool, but he's also the Chief Executive of the Liverpool Big Company, have had a period uh, where they've been unwell. So I think on behalf of the combined authority, um, we'd like to wish him and both of them a speedy recovery. And also on behalf of the combined authority, um, we'd like to extend our sincere condolences to Councillor Wood, uh, who's the Deputy Portfolio Holder uh, for Low Carbon and Renewable Energy, um, as she recently lost her mum. So, want to send our condolences to her and her family. Um, items 7 and 9 contain exempt appendices due to the information related to financial or business affairs of a person. Therefore, if we do wish to discuss the content of those uh, appendices, Jill will guide us through what we need to do at that time. Um, and just for consideration, the draft final accounts uh, were due to be considered at Item 17, and unfortunately the external officers aren't in a position to submit their report for consideration today, and that means that the signing off of the final accounts will need to be deferred until a later meeting. Um, can I do two quick things, which is uh, Dwayne Johnson uh, is, is here, but I think this is your second uh, meeting, Dwayne, and I should have uh, remiss of me not to have welcomed you to your first one, but welcome to your second one. And Eric Robinson, as we know, has left um, as the Chief Executive of Wirral. Um, and Eric did a lot of sterling work on behalf of everybody in the combined authority, not just in Wirral. So we wish him well in his new endeavours. Uh, but Paul Sator, uh, as the Interim Chief Executive of Wirral, is here. And this is your first. So we're getting better. Um, are there any apologies for absence? I've received apologies from Councillor Morgan, Jane Kennedy, Councillor Bowden, Councillor Grocourt, Councillor Moran, Councillor Sporrell, Councillor Wood, Councillor Hardy, Councillor Robertson Collins, Gideon Benthoven, Reverend Cannon Loudon, and Councillor Nicholas. Any further apologies to that? Okay, item two is declarations of interest. Um, our members know uh, about what to do. Item three is the minutes of the previous meeting of the Combined Authority on the 28th of June 2019, and that included in pages 1 to 10. Can I ask if they are agreed, please? Um, four is um, updates, and tomorrow um, I'm going to be proud to join the LGBT plus community, allies, and supporters at the Liverpool City Region Pride Festival, because that's what it is. It's a technical and extravaganza. Um, Pride is a fun and colourful and enjoyable event where we have the opportunity to celebrate love diversity and progress, um, but it's perhaps on occasions like this when we should remember that Pride began as a protest against hate and bigotry that meant that people were ostracised, marginalised and targeted simply because of who they were and who they loved. Pride actually came to Liverpool in 2008 uh, in response to the brutal murder of Michael Coles and, uh, uh, you know, something that I'm very much aware of having been the Lord Mayor in 2008 and having spent considerable amount of time with Michael's parents. Uh, so Pride was created partly to honour Michael and we should never forget him and that's why I'm proud to be speaking also at his vigil on the 1st of August. And also, while this is going on, we think that things are improving, don't we? And then we see and hear about the homophobic attack in that field just last month. Um, and that shows again and throws into sharp focus exactly why we must 
continue the protests and the, um, the pressure to ensure that people start to look at um, homophobic attacks and um, any diversity uh, issues in, in the round. And I'm proud, again, that Liverpool City Region Command Authority will be supporting tomorrow's event. And you may well have noticed that staff have got um, multicoloured rainbow lanyards on, um, and we'll be joining many of you at St George's Hall tomorrow and um, Liverpool uh, are also sponsored, Liverpool City Council are also sponsoring that event, although I have to say um, Chief Executive Langnard is not quite as pretty as, as our one from Liverpool. I think that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, on Tuesday I spent some time in St Helens and, and firstly celebrating the completion of the new Windle Island at, uh, Junction Works and that was a three point Five million project, which has seen greater junction capacity, improved pedestrian safety, and smooth traffic flows, as well as better access in and out of St. Helens. And it really does work because we went at rush hour, and myself and the leader of St. St. Helens Council uh, witnessed that ourselves. Um, we then both went to Langtree Park to support St. Helens Council in their bid to bring something called Glass Futures to the town. Uh, and just been saying to, to David Baines, who is a leader in St. Thomas, about Glass Futures, it doesn't really encapsulate what this is about. This is a really exciting, very much um, fourth industrial revolution type initiative and could be transformational for um, what used to be the glass industry in St. Helens, but it also um, helps out for the Liverpool city region to achieve its aim of being net zero carbon by 2040 because it, it really is about the energy use for energy intensive industries as well so it's a really fantastic thing and it will bring glass making back to its natural home um, David Baines has told me to say but it's in the 21st century setting and um, that means that manufacturing um, high value jobs etc etc all the apprenticeships around that they'll all be part of a, a truly transformational project Earlier in the month, uh, Lord Heseltine launched his new report uh, called Empowering English Cities and it focused on the need for further powers to be given to combined authorities and to Metro Mayors and remarked that devolution was being held back by Brexit along with lots of other things and that's in his words. Um, he said it hangs like the darkest storm cloud over our body politic and I couldn't agree more with that. So I responded to the report by saying that the whole point of devolution is that at a local level we're able to make decisions about our future better than white old mandarins who know nothing of the specific needs of local circumstances um, and that's why the leaders uh, and, the, and the mayor um, in November 2015 took that great decision to pull together and to collaborate as a combined authority. Um, it appeared, didn't it, before the, the current Prime Minister that the previous government went cold on devolution. So there is an opportunity for the new Prime Minister to commit to devolving further powers and resources so that areas like ours can start to shape their own destiny. And that is the very ethos why people did start to join together. And of course, talking about the new Prime Minister, um, on Wednesday, Following the outcome of the Conservative Party of leadership election, Boris Johnson was appointed as the country's Prime Minister. Um, his statement outside Downing Street, Street and appointment of a cabinet that overwhelmingly supports leaving the EU without a deal on the 31st of October means that it's hard to conclude anything other than a no deal Brexit is now the default position for the UK. And this, to all of us, I think, is hugely concerning in the city region whether we support leave or remain because the Treasury's own analysis suggests that there could be a 9.3% drop in North West GBA as a result of no deal. And this analysis doesn't even take into account the interconnectedness of supply chains and the particular exposure of sub-regions such as ours whose economic strengths are based on manufacturing. Again, I don't think people knew we didn't tease it out enough during the debate, but 60% of our exports are to the EU from this area, and the analysis from the University of Sussex suggests a Conservative small estimate of 15,000 job losses with 
in the city region if there was to be a no deal. So our responsibility as elected leaders must do be to do everything that we can to protect the people of our city region from such economic harm and the aftershocks of Brexit and we have to prepare um, for every eventuality. So today I'm writing to the new Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster who has been placed in charge of the government's no deal preparations to invite him to the city region to meet with us all as elected representatives, our businesses and our trade unions to discuss what our specific challenges are and what the government can do to support us in preparation for whatever lies ahead. Of course I'll keep colleagues updated when we get a response. And, and just finally, uh, we had something called our annual conversation. Uh, this is when the government meets with us and we talk through uh, what's happened. And we think that was very well received and there was recognition of the huge progress that we've made in such a short space of time. Um, we will have something more formal on that, but I'm very hopeful that the government quite rightly will identify the strengths in the city region and how we as a combined authority would be able to progress um, economic growth, inclusive economic growth across our area. Item five is um, households into work and our first report is a positive progress report on the Household into Work programme. Uh, and Mayor Anderson is going to introduce this, but just before he does, um, Ian Mayer oversaw the development uh, of the programme and should be thanked for his input into this. Um, I, I've met with some of the people who have been beneficiaries, and I think we'll hear from Mayor Anderson and others, just how this innovative approach is really helping some of those people who have had um, significant difficulties on, on, on occasion multi-complex needs that have needed to be tackled and our programme is not a sanctions first approach, it's quite the opposite. So, um, Joe? Yeah, thanks Steve. Um, I, I think just, the, I, I just want to make a couple of points on, on this, but not to, too long. Um, it was part of the devolution appeal itself that we had um, the ability to do program like this in terms of welfare to work as we uh, presented it when we uh, demanded certain asks from government for devolution. And so um, this has been, uh, in my view, something that has been uh, desperately needed in order for us to really track um, the, what we all describe as inclusive growth. It's about making sure that we uh, apply support and give support to families and individuals that want to try to get uh, back into work. And so that's the, you know, the simple, um, if you like, task, uh, but very complicated in its, in its requirements and its needs. But I think we've done really well with, with, with the programme. I think we can demonstrate that it's made a huge impact. Um, and, and, you know, the bottom line is in, in uh, one part of it in its conclusions, it talks about how it's very difficult to quantify the financial um, value of this intervention approach. But what is absolutely clear is that it has a huge social impact. And the bottom line is, as we often talk about growing the economy and growing the city region's economy, we've got to make sure that people are regenerated as well as the infrastructure. And this is what this is about is actually breaking down the barriers and tackling those complex, often complex needs that people have, enabling them to get back in work. And I think what I uh, am proud of is the fact that we're able to uh, now uh, submit uh, evidence within a couple of months that shows how intervention like this can really help people turn their lives around, not just theirs, but their families. It's Surely, it's a model of investing, invest to aid that we get better outcomes from. So I look forward for us putting together the final conclusions of this, but then submitting it to government to make sure that we do very much more of this across the whole city region. Because what we've touched on here is only a fraction 
But if we can and prove, and I believe we will be able to prove and demonstrate that this works, we can then confidently ask for more uh, and use it to make, as I said, the greater inroads into terms of people's lives around. So I think the report is well written, um, but as I said, we wait some more data before we do a final uh, report and then we'll submit that to government to ask for more funding. Thanks, Joe. Um, we, we can provide everybody with the statistics and all that, but actually it's it's the human nature of this approach that's the most important. And two of the people who have benefited from um, the hard work of staff and, and of, um, of Ian and other politicians, uh, Evan and Michael, um, uh, I think they may want to comment. Uh, no pressure, Emma, I know what you're like. Um, but would you be happy to come and say a few words, uh, Michael? Yeah. Great stuff. When I first started the programme, I weren't sure whether it was for me until I started and I wanted to give it a go. <clears throat> As I said, it's just been five months and um, I've struggled, and I've really struggled, you know, throughout my time, you know, getting myself together and my thought process and like, what, what I really wanted to do. And I finally, um, over the past two months, started getting job interviews and things like that started getting me, me foot in the door with job interviews and actually I've got myself a part time job which is thanks to the programme and I think that's basically it really. Sorry I'm a bit nervous, I didn't know really what to say. Can I add a little bit there for my point because he's, tell, he's one to sell it himself here. Uh, my name is Lisa Wehren, I work in the news area and put it on top of this. Michael came onto the programme five months ago. His attitude had been involved at the job centre. I was out of one to support the program. After the first hour, he saw some got an understanding. He's never missed an appointment since then. He's had health problems that we've helped to overcome. By purchasing a bike, because he struggled to walk a far distance, but he could cycle. So if he was going to look for employment, we were looking in the local area, which would help him as his transport. He's got two children, and his, pa his three children, his passion is to support them. We got through that process of, we looked one day, and this is the big thing that hit me, we use a star to track people's progress. You show it to clients and they look at it, and you try and explain it, but for the first time, I saw a light switch on in any of my clients because my thought went, yeah, I have to do it. I have got one thing. And from there, <coughs> I sent a CV off. But after that, I didn't have to do anything else. He progressed himself, getting job interviews, I had to find the way. And as he says, he's got a part-time job, not just promoting himself, but in the city centre at the weekend, being in the middle of the work, promoting the city to a woman from New Zealand who he helped. And he said, when you go back to New Zealand, let the people know that you've got a scout who is kind, and that's what we all are. So he's only selling themselves, so I'm sorry I that he's there. What, what Lisa saw about there, um, the net, what, Netball World Cup being on over, over the last couple of weekends, um, and it was, there was a lady there, and she was struggling. She, had, like, she was there with her daughter, she was struggling mm -hmm. though, with her leg. I, I, I like just got her a chair, that was all, that's all I did, I just got her a chair so she could sit down and watch the back for It was made up, it was made up for a bit, no, just with me doing that. Well done. Um, it's a heart-rending story, isn't it, that you can, when given a second chance, actually fulfil the potential. So we hope you go on to, to even greater things, Michael. Um, sitting next to you is... Um, <laughs> The young lady that I've met on a number of occasions who really is also uh, very impressive, so I'll, I'll hand over and she'll run the rest of the meeting. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, my name's Emma Pettigrew. I've been on the Household into Work scheme for 10 months. Um, I got asked to go on it 
like from January last year, but I only ended up going on it in September because it took me that long to get the confidence to go in and see her. When I walked in the room, <laughs> like we got on with her hugs on it, like straight away, and she was like, Oh, um, I can help you do this, I can help you do that. And I was just like, being promised all this in my past, not until I've come of it, you won't be able to help. I haven't got this, I haven't got that. And she was like, Well, sit down and think what you want to do. And then we'll get you the stuff to do it. And I was like, behave yourself, you won't be able to get like, because I wanted to be a personal trainer. So I was like, I need gym equipment, I need clothes, trainees, blah, blah, blah. Head and sorted it. I needed a laptop to start my course, head and sorted it. I qualified in January as a level two fitness instructor and a level three personal trainer. And I start in two weeks time on a level three to the level four sports massage course. And I also take part in part-time white collar boxing as well because I have the confidence now to go out and just try for what I want to do and, and, and get it done. And next year I'm jumping out of my airplane as well. <laughs> and if you're good, go and uh, spot you for a parachute, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I think, Heather, uh, do you want to add anything? I was just, just going to, um, kind of as with Michael, came to see me and she'd been in a sperm's relationship for five years and um, basically not been allowed to do anything, not been allowed to leave the house, uh, certainly not been allowed to go to the gym or be around other men. Um, so Emma's dream felt impossible to her at first and we uh, we just worked really hard and I, I feel like I didn't actually do that much. I think Emma did all of it, I think Emma just needed somebody to tell that she could. Um, and Emma, her whole dream was to basically book a holiday and take her daughter on holiday, which, which to a lot of us seems very small, but to Emma it was enormous, and Emma has booked that holiday, uh, and is taking her daughter away, and she's just signed up with the Job Centre to um, pursue self-employment, uh, which is one of the kind of best ways to be a personal trainer. Um, so yeah, she's signed up, ready to be self-employed, um, in a new, very good relationship and working really hard to be a good mum and a good personal trainer. And uh, I'm not saying any of this because she's offered me a free personal trainer. Two fantastic stories. There's loads and loads of, of, of more of those. It's a completely different approach. You don't have to punish people through sanctions and uh, I mean, the stick all the time. Sometimes the carrot works, and this is a great example of what we've done as a combined authority in the city region. That's different than any national government approach. So um, thanks for coming, and, and we'll obviously keep in contact. We'll see you soon. Um, Number six, item six is the uh, local industrial strategy and uh, Casey's going to take us through that report. Yeah, so this is the update on the local industrial strategy position statement, um, which essentially sets out our evidence on what we know about the distinctive strengths and challenges of the economy for the Liverpool City region. And it identifies emerging priorities and initial thinking on actions that we may need to take, um, particularly to tackle the challenges that we know we've got. Um, but also how we make the most of the opportunities um, that are facing the city region. We're testing that evidence base with a range of stakeholders, um, seeking views from businesses, the public sector, social economy and academia, and we want this to be genuinely inclusive. So we're also looking um, at seeking the views of people more widely across the city region on emerging thinking and what actions we need to take um, to improve the lives of them and their communities. Any questions, Kurt? See? Just a, just a comment on the, uh, the document. I've got to say, it's a comprehensive document in itself today. I think I welcome the um, engagement that's happened so far with both the Lex and the business community. Um, and I look forward to taking the document forward, creating something which is really bold, brash, innovative, and different for our city region than some of the other submissions that have been put forward so far. So I look forward to that continuing work. But I've got to say, it's a good working program. Thanks. So can we take the recommendations set out on page 11 of the previous item and the recommendations set out on page 21 of item 6? Is that agreed? Um, 
seven is um, SIF, Strategic Investment Fund, and Councillor Hackett is going to take us briefly through this report. Thanks, Chair. Uh, this concerns the development of uh, 34,000 square foot of Grade 8 office on Wirral Waters. Uh, SIF funded uh, up to £3 million, pounds, together with support from our local authority on Wirral, is absolutely vital, of course, to its delivery. Um, and also uh, marking the space to expand in local businesses as well as income and business. And the SIF economic appraisers confirmed that it's good value for money. But can I say as well, it's part of the wider Wirral Waters development, and uh, we are actually moving on that now. And uh, it's very encouraging number of, a number of issues, uh, a number of developments within there which will make a huge, huge difference. And I think also, just like anything uh, in any area, Actually, seeing physical buildings go up, the scenery generation happens. There's so many, as you, as you said earlier, Chair, there's so many uh, uh, um, uh, economic uh, indicators from that, both socially and in other ways uh, that, that, that helps. But, but I do believe, along with a number of uh, other big ticket projects that are happening on the world, including the uh, World Growth Plan, it's going to completely transform the area over the next five to ten years. Certainly in the short term, I think we're going to see big, big differences. As, as I say, it's moving at pace. I dare say it's, I think visitors coming to the city region, and particularly the waterfronts in the next 10 years, certainly, 12, certainly 15 years, <coughs> coming down the river to the new expanded group line, group line facilities, won't recognise the difference between one side of the water and the other, such will be the transformation. And that will happen, and, you know, and that's, what, that's where we're at, that's what we want to do. And we all want to do that together. That, that, that's, um very ambitious, uh, and, and, and we'll try and help as six leaders in the momentum. We'll try and help for Wirral to achieve its, its full potential. Um, can we agree the recommendations are set out on page 95 and 96 then? Um, eight is the city, region, and town centre fund, and again, Councillor Hackett, you're going to talk us through that, which is to provide each um, constituency local authority with up to one million pounds for their individual town centre priorities. Yeah, th th this will help and make a big difference to town centres which are all struggling um, across the region, struggling across the country um, and cer certainly with the combined affairs funding and uh, along with SIF funding uh, and match funding for other areas will really uh, help kick start some of the ideas and the schemes that local authorities have got across the, the region itself. Confidence as well that the program will soon to launch commission will lead to further transformation, transformational projects in our town centres. Indeed, um, I, I think that's hopefully the, the idea behind all of that. Are there any questions? Sure. Thank you, Jay. It's not a question, it's, a, it's more of a comment to say we really welcome this, um, especially for noting the investment in both Hayden and Prescott. We're seeing a revised in town centres and this is going to help us develop our town centres and our independent sectors so we much welcome this and of course our announcement last week of looking to buy Kirby so we hope that the funding will be available in the future to support that as well Chair. As a, as a former Kirby lad, um, yeah, I think we're, we're all can we uh, agree the recommendations on 169 and 170 then please? Um, eight, uh, nine is. Um, Eureka, a, a, a fantastic uh, children's museum which is going to be based in, in Seacom and the report seeks approval to commit up to £6.64 million of SIF grant funding to support the development of that project. Um, Mersey Museums, um, which will be based at Seacom Ferry, uh, is a hugely ambitious project. Uh, we understand that the applicants are viewing um, what we're saying via the webcast um, today, so um, I think they'll see the enthusiasm that we have for what they're trying to achieve. Um, are there any questions in regard to um, that particular um, part of the business? Um, Pat, do you want to take us through the report then? Yeah, just, just to say, Stuart Chair, I mean, as you've ever said, it's a fantastic project. Yeah, as you rightly said, it's a fantastic project and, and what could be better than welcoming a national award winning science focused uh, museum uh, for children to the Liverpool City region. This is a £12 million uh, 
uh, project to develop a Eureka Children's Museum at Seacombe Ferry Terminal. It replaces the uh, existing space pools that a lot of you might have been to over, over, over the years, but have been there a long time. The, the other Eureka one, I believe, is based in Halifax, Yorkshire. The museum has already received three million as you said in, in national money and has raised charitable funds and now requires up to six point six million in SIF support to complete the project. Civic economic appraisals confirm it's very good value for money and the and CA's contribution will also fund necessary building upgrades uh, for Mersey travel. The museum chair will welcome <coughs> children from across the city region and indeed the country. Uh, Eureka has already started engaging local school children on how the museum should work in a process called co-creation. We hope that this will improve its inclusive growth, including by inspiring our children into science careers. Finally, I welcome this project, of course, and look forward to further developments with Mersey Ferries and Wirral Water to help stitch it into the city's region, region's cultural offer. And can I say as well, uh, as I said in the first report, it's also right next to the big huge it's a great project, fantastic. And helps towards that being a catalyst for that wider regeneration yeah. on, on the world side. Um, can we agree the recommendations as set out on page 201, please? Um, 10 is the National Local Growth Assurance Framework to be revised and following feedback from uh, a number of government departments. We were asked to approve a revised local assurance framework for both the combined authority and the local enterprise partnership. The report also seeks approval to offer some nominations to the left company structure. Um, are there any questions? No, okay, then can we agree the recommendations are set out on page 319, please? 11 is uh, requested changes to um, previous SIF. Projects and Mark's going to take us through the report, which seeks um, some um, changes to what we've previously <coughs> agreed in regard to those um, uh, strategic investment <coughs> projects. Thank you, Chair. The report contains two changes that we can't put through the delegated authority that you granted to officers at the last constitution change. The first is for Paddington Village and comprises a change in use, so from commercial to residential and hotel uses on site. There's no change to the financial or the output specification of the project. We consider it positive and it will speed up delivery. The second is a change to the Speak Training and Education Centre, which has suffered a 19-month delay in delivery. And so the change is simply to adapt the agreements to it to make room for that delay. Are there any questions for um, Mark? Can we agree the recommendations uh, set out on uh, this three, eight, five, yeah, on page 385, please? Okay, item 12 then is uh, the Mersey Tidal project. And I think Mark, you're just going to briefly take us through the first part of this, I believe, and then um, Councillor Powell, who's the portfolio holder, um, will take us through the actual report. Thanks, Chair. I have the easy bit, which is to remind us what the opportunity is here. The global potential for tidal energy is roughly equivalent to a thousand Hinkley Point seeds, and is almost totally untapped. So there are only two big tidal energy schemes: one in Korea and the other in France. The totally untapped potential, both for energy production and for whoever generates capacity in this sector huge export opportunity of materials, of skills, and know-how. It could be something of critical importance to the city region, but also to the UK, UK PLC. That's the global opportunity. If we move on, oh. the UK opportunity from the thousand Hinkley Point Seas is for us to generate twice the annual electricity we need in this country. And there are three places that are most suitable for tidal energy generation in the UK. Liverpool Bay, Seven Estuary and Bristol Channel, and the Wash in South East England. 
and there's a good reason that we're right at the top of that. We've missed a slide, everyone. The, the good reason that we're right on top of that is because we have shallow waters, a high tidal range, and a really strong local industry related to renewables, thanks to our track record out in the bay with, 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 with um, wind power. The options we're looking at could power um, either four times, uh, four times the total power generation of all the wind park farms out on the Liverpool Bay, or 500 new Everton stadiums. So it's material, it's significant, it's significant for UK PLC and it's really game changing, really transformational for the Liverpool City region. That's what we're aiming at when we're, when we're looking into this project. And so it's really important to us as a CA to follow an evidence based best practice approach to hunting down this opportunity. And at that point, I'd like to hand it to Councillor Paulin. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Mayor. Um, as Mark alludes to, this is a really exciting project. And the purpose of the report today is up to, to update the combined authority on phase two of the Mersey Tidal project in answer to that in the outline of business case. In February of this year, the CA approved resources for further development uh, of this transformational project, which could deliver green, predictable energy for the whole city region. Work is underway on the outline business case. This is led by Sean Benson as head of Tidal Project and development. Consultants out and Waitmans are based locally but have global expertise in this, uh, in this subject area. A, ste a steering group of academic and industrial experts is also helping improve the project and given the climate emergency of our commitment to be net carbon neutral by 2040, I warmly welcome the development of this project and happy to move the recommendation chair. Thanks Rob. Uh so important is this to UK PLC that uh, people will have seen hopefully the press release by John MacDonald who's committed a future Labour government to uh, fully fund the development and the delivery of a major title project, possibly around £3.5 million but that, that's uh, not a scientific um, uh, estimate at this moment because we're still in the developmental process. But, um, this is part of Labour's Green New Deal and will create thousands of jobs, as Rob said, and of course, lots and lots of opportunities, including the export opportunities that was uh, mentioned by Mark. Um, we're expecting a very important visitor to the city region this afternoon, and I think there'll be um, further discussions and um, press around um, that visit. But we're ahead, okay, in the Liverpool city region, we're ahead. If we can capture this market, just imagine what that might do for our economic fortunes going forward. Um, but it also fulfills our commitment to be net zero uh, carbon by 2040 and also the climate change stuff that both um, as local authorities, and I know Liverpool did it uh, fairly recently and we've, we've done it ourselves fairly recently, we're committed to um, do what we can to tackle climate change across the um, country. Can we therefore then agree the recommendations are set out on page 39 of this? Um, 13 is something called the approval of a series of outreach procurement and um, Casey is going to take us briefly through that. Yeah, so this service is a needs led to certain outreach service covering mental and physical health and delivered through consistent engagement, assessment and referral on to the most appropriate housing support or other health services required. Uh, the specification for the service has been developed by a multidisciplinary commissioning group made up of officers from all six local authorities and covered health, public health and homelessness. Uh, the report gives us the opportunity to ensure we're able to deliver the new service without any delay. Can we agree the recommendations set out on pages 3 and 9 and 5 please? Um, item 14 is um, TCF Transforming Cities Fund and it's about um, LCR walking and cycling network phase one, in other words the active travel stuff uh, that would be promoted and it seeks the approval to commit up to £4.8 million 
of that TCF funding for the first phase of the commissioning of that network. And Liam Robertson is going to take us through that report. Yeah, thanks. This report sort of nicely follows on from a report we had a couple of cycles ago, if you'll excuse the pun, um, in terms of uh, how we agreed previously to allocate uh, ESIF and sort of funds towards this programme. And we are asking to now commit a uh, further £4.8 million of match funding from the Transforming Cities um, budget that we have. Uh, I think this is really quite exciting, and when you do look at the map that you've got on pages 453 in your pack, I think that really shows the scale of our initial ambition. When you look at how we are going to be developing a network that will allow people to ride their bikes from speaking south of the conurbation all the way up to Southport in the north, from um, uh, Seacombe out to Eastham, uh, Seacombe out to uh, Liso, sorry, on, on the Wirral, when you look at some of the things around uh, St Helens, around kind of Prescott, down to um, Witness and across to Runcorn, real great start of a vision on which we want to build much further that will really embed active travel as a key part of people's daily lives and their means of getting around our region. And a good start, but we are hugely ambitious plans for something much more expansive. Uh, and we'll bring those to the combined authority when the uh, appropriate time arises. Okay, um, can we agree the recommendations are set out on page 415, please? Just in case anybody's um, lost track of where we are in regard to what we've agreed already, the cumulative sum of those last few items is around £20 million pounds worth of investment across the city region and uh, it just uh, emphasises, I think, once again, the uh, positive nature of having a devolution agreement and being able to make those decisions ourselves on where we uh, decide that funding is best spent. Fifteen uh, total of funding is the approval to disperse additional funding to support the development of transport feasibility studies, um, wonderfully titled, uh, but Liam's going to take us through that. Yeah, very simplistically, back in 2017, we pulled together a pot for um, feasibility study work to make sure that we were able to uh, develop projects up to a stage that they would be more kind of up and ready to deliver when funding became available. Effectively, what we're seeking to do is spend uh, the rest of that money on 12 different proposed major transport projects that you can see on pages 458 and 459 so we can develop those up further so when funding becomes available those schemes can be delivered. Any questions for Liam? Can we agree then the recommendation set out on 457 and 458 of the report please? Um, 16 is uh, a report which provides an update on the development of the business case to assess options for the delivery of bus services in the Liverpool city region. And Matt Goggins, who's the head of bus routes, will take us through this particular report. Thank you. Um, buses are critical to the Liverpool city region. Uh, access to opportunity, addressing social isolation, addressing problems of air quality and congestion, all rely on an attractive and comprehensive bus network, which provides a real alternative to the private car. So the report gives an update on the progress we've made with the formal assessment of options for, uh, for bus reform, which are enabled by both the Evolution and the Bus Services Act. As a reminder, we've got three options that we're addressing. Uh, continuing with our industry-leading bus alliance, replacing the alliance with an enhanced partnership, or introducing a franchise uh, bus network. We're intending to recommend one of these options in early 2020. Doing nothing is not an option. The report sets out some of the themes for improvement both through our bus strategy